From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I live and work in the middle of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Alaska is a land of mystery, danger, stunning beauty, and valuable resources. Over the decades, fortune seekers have been drawn to Alaska in search of gold, oil, fish, and crab. These fortune seekers are usually young men with little to lose and big dreams of becoming rich. Throughout Alaska's history, a wave of crime has followed each economic boom. And in my podcast, I will tell you these stories of crime while I share a little about the rich cultural history and geography of this complex state I call home. Since authorities began keeping records in 1988, 60,700 people have been reported missing in Alaska. That's five people reported missing every year per 1,000 residents. Each year, an average of 2,250 people disappear in Alaska, twice the national average. Some of these people are found alive and well, and the remains of others are eventually discovered, but many disappear without a trace. Most of Alaska is a vast, untamed wilderness and it draws adventurers from around the world to climb the steep mountains, kayak the raging rivers, or simply experience nature in its rawest form. Alaska also attracts dropouts, those running from the law or the responsibilities of their lives, and young people trying to, quote, find themselves or wishing to experience a wilderness lifestyle. Reality rarely matches the fantasy. There's a reason so few people live in the rugged wilderness of Alaska. Alaska is a place of extremes. The state is defined by bitterly cold temperatures, raging rivers, harsh storms, treacherous mountains, and wild predators at the top of the food chain. People who have lived a lifetime in the wilderness respect the dangers and know not to take them lightly. Still, sometimes even those knowledgeable about the wilderness and its perils disappear. I hope you will join me on my podcast to listen to stories of murder and mystery from the last frontier. And I want to get started today with my first story, The McCarthy Massacre of 1983. Most Alaskans are adventurous and self-sufficient individuals who can survive on their own, but are willing to lend a helping hand to others. A few people, though, come to Alaska to escape their problems or to hide from the law. Usually, they bring their problems with them. As I mentioned, I live in the wilderness on Kodiak Island in Alaska, where my husband and I own a remote lodge. And the story I am about to tell you reflects my worst nightmare. I live in the midst of the world's most concentrated population of huge brown bears, but bears are not what scare me most. There are no roads or cars where I live and no other human habitations within miles of my home. So the most frightening thing I can imagine would be to look out a window on a stormy winter night and catch the glimpse of a human shadow running across the walk. A few times hunters camping in the area and in need of our help have knocked on our door late at night. And while we were happy to assist them, I realized there was no one we could call for help if the visitors threatened us. The Alaska State Troopers are the responsible law enforcement agents outside the Kodiak city limits, but they're based in the town of Kodiak, 70 air miles from my home, and they can only respond during daylight hours because it isn't safe to fly over this mountainous island at night. We're on our own if some psychopath forces his way into our lives. Like the folks in the story I'm about to tell you, a plane carrying our mail, supplies, and groceries stops at our dock once a week, and eerily enough, our mail plane, like the plane that serviced the doomed residents of McCarthy, is also on Tuesday. Since the plane lands and pulls up to our dock, we're sometimes the only people here to meet it, but anyone can get supplies and mail or pay for a seat fare on this plane. Occasionally, people we've never met show up for the plane to wait for supplies or passengers, and we invite these strangers into our home for coffee and cookies while they wait for the plane. 
Usually these folks are nice and appreciate our hospitality, but once in a while someone makes me uncomfortable, and I breathe a sigh of relief when I see him speed away from our dock in his boat heading back toward his campsite. We know nothing about these strangers, but we assume and hope they mean us no harm. The folks in McCarthy, Alaska, probably also felt safe around the neighbors and strangers who showed up to wait for their mail plane. The people who lived in the wilderness near McCarthy were bound together by their chosen lifestyle. They enjoyed their solitary lives, but each week they looked forward to gathering with their neighbors and socializing for an hour or two while they waited for the mail plane to arrive. Everything changed on that fateful day in 1983. Mail day would never be the same again. In 1983, Les and Flo Hagelin's home in McCarthy, Alaska, was a gathering spot where the 22 residents of the Kennecott-McCarthy area waited for the weekly mail plane. The Hagelins lived near the small airstrip where the plane landed, and not only did they offer their hospitality, but they even built an addition onto their front porch, where they would leave uncollected mail and groceries so nearby residents could drop by at their convenience to pick up their freight. The Hagelins owned the only two-way radio in the area strong enough to communicate with this outside world, and they relayed daily weather reports to the Federal Aviation Administration office in Cordova. The Hagelin house was more than just a place for the residents to sit and wait for the plane to arrive. Except for the mail plane pilot, the Hagelins were McCarthy residents' lone link to civilization. Tuesday, March 1, 1983, was mail day. McCarthy and Kennecott are located four miles from each other in the middle of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve, approximately 120 miles or 193 kilometers northeast of Cordova and 230 miles or 370 kilometers east of Anchorage. Wrangell St. Elias encompasses an area about the size of West Virginia, with four mountain ranges converging in the park. The temperature fluctuates from 50 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, or minus 45.5 degrees Celsius in the winter, to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 32.2 degrees Celsius in the summer. The annual snowfall averages 52 inches, or 132 centimeters. Around the turn of the 20th century, the richest concentration of copper ever mined was discovered in the mountains above Kennecott. The town of Kennecott was developed as a place for the miners to work and live, while McCarthy was developed as a place for the miners to play. By the 1930s, most of the ore was gone, and Kennecott and McCarthy became ghost towns. The railroad track that was used to transport the ore soon fell into disrepair and became the McCarthy Road. This road begins where the pavement ends in Chitna, 61 miles or 98.2 kilometers to the west, and by 1983 the road was nearly impassable. Residents of the area were mostly stranded during the long winter of 1983, and they were dependent upon and looked forward to their Tuesday mail plane. In 1983, McCarthy had no running water, no telephones, and no electricity except for the power provided by individual generators. The independent souls who called this remote area home had little contact with the outside world, so the weekly gathering to wait for the mail plane was a way to share news. On February 28th, the night before mail day, in Kennecott, four miles north of the McCarthy airstrip, 29-year-old Chris Richards played chess with his neighbor, 39-year-old Louis Hastings. Hastings, an unemployed computer programmer, had moved to Alaska from California in 1980 and had only lived in the Kennecott area for a year. According to Richards, the evening was unremarkable, just a friendly game between two neighbors. The following morning, as Richards cooked breakfast, Hastings again appeared at his front door. Richards assumed Hastings was on his way to meet the mail plane, and he pushed open the door and invited Hastings in for tea. Richards then turned his back to the door while he continued cooking his meal. A moment later, Richards felt something strike his right cheek, shattering his glasses. He immediately ducked and then felt an object hit his head. He turned toward Hastings and saw the other man walking toward him, the barrel of a pistol fitted with a silencer protruding from his gloved hand, ready to fire again. 
Richards grabbed Hastings and they began to struggle, while Richards screamed at Hastings to stop shooting. Hastings said, look, you're already dead. If you'll just quit fighting, I'll make it easy for you. Richards fumbled for a knife from the sink and stabbed Hastings in the left upper chest and the right leg. Richards then fled the cabin into waist-deep snow, wearing only socks, one slipper, a t-shirt, and light corduroy pants. The temperature in Kennecott that morning was 10 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 17.2 degrees Celsius. Hastings' pistol jammed, and he grabbed the rifle he had stashed outside the cabin door. While Hastings fired shots at him, Richards fought his way three-quarters of a mile, or 1.2 kilometers, up a steep hill to an unoccupied tourist lodge, where he found boots, a parka, and snowshoes. Richard continued out the far door of the lodge, but Hastings, who had been following Richard's bloody footprints, thought Richards was still in the lodge, so he set the lodge on fire. Richards couldn't manage the snowshoes, so he staggered and then crawled one-tenth of a mile, or 161 meters, to the southwest to the cabin of Tim and Amy Nash. The Nashes were a young couple who had just gotten married on Christmas Day, and after a long honeymoon, they had only returned to the Kennecott area two weeks earlier. Tim and Amy bandaged Richard's wounds while he told them what had happened. Since Hastings appeared to be on his way to McCarthy, where area residents would soon be gathering to meet the mail plane, Richards and the Nashes decided to arm themselves and head to the runway and to the Heglins' home to warn the others about Hastings. Meanwhile, 52-year-old Maxine Edwards left her husband at home while she crossed the frozen Kennecott River and proceeded to the Heglins' house to await the mail plane. Flo Heglin, 58, and Les, 64, had lived in McCarthy since 1967 and were considered the unofficial postmasters by area residents. The Heglins were the heart of McCarthy, and they provided a foundation for the independent loaners who called the area home. If an area resident wanted to send a message to a friend or relative, or if a relative needed to contact one of the McCarthy residents with an urgent message, it was the Heglins who sent and received these communications on their sideband radio. The Heglins and their home were central to the loosely knit community of residents within a 50-mile radius of McCarthy. Back at their home in Kennecott, The Nashes bundled Richards onto a sled and towed it behind their snow machine as they sped toward McCarthy and the airstrip. When they reached the airstrip, they met Gary Green, a pilot and guide. Green was cleaning off his airplane, and when he heard their story, he told them he had seen Hastings 20 minutes earlier heading towards the Heglin's house. Tim Nash volunteered to check on the Heglins while Green warmed up his plane in preparation to fly Richards to Glen Allen 40 minutes away for medical care. Green said he would contact the troopers and request their assistance. As Green was loading Richards into the plane, Amy Nash saw her husband running down the airstrip toward them. He had just been to the Heglins' house where he'd smelled the acrid aroma of gun smoke and had seen blood splattered over the interior of the house. Tim believed the Heglins were dead and said when he walked into the kitchen, he saw Hastings standing on the back porch. Nash fired at Hastings and missed, but when Hastings returned fire, he struck Nash in the right leg. The Nashes told Green to go for help and then they made the fateful decision to stay at the airstrip and warn the others. Once Green took off, he radioed the incoming mail plane pilot and told him not to land at McCarthy. He explained what had happened and asked the mail plane pilot to contact the Alaska State Troopers in Glen Allen and request their assistance. Hastings, meanwhile, had planned to wait at the Heglins' home and kill his neighbors one by one as they arrived at the Heglins'. But once Tim Nash escaped from the house, Hastings knew he needed to alter his plan and hunt down Nash before he could warn the others. While Tim and Amy waited in the freezing morning air, Hastings followed a dog sled trail through the thick brush back to the airstrip. He crawled up a large mound of plowed snow across the runway from the Nashes and fired 10 rounds at the newlyweds who stood 250 yards or 228.6 meters away from him. 
He then walked to within 50 feet or 15.24 meters of their bodies and fired two more shots and then continued to approach, firing two final kill shots into their heads. He dragged their bodies to the top of the snowbank across the runway from where they had died in an attempt to hide them in deeper snow. Soon after Hastings climbed the snowbank, two more area residents, Harley King and Donna Byram, arrived at the north end of the airstrip on King's snow machine. Harley King, 61, and his wife, Jo, had lived on their homestead 15 miles west of McCarthy since 1966. Jo, a well-known bush pilot and flight instructor, had flown her plane to Anchorage and was waiting for the weather to improve before flying back to McCarthy, so she was not home that fateful day. But her husband had agreed to give Donna Byram, 32, a ride to the airstrip. Byram, who lived between the King's home and McCarthy, was planning to fly out on the mail plane. Byram saw large blotches of blood on the snow-covered airstrip and then saw Hastings standing on the snowbank. When they drew closer, Hastings opened fire on them. Byram was standing on the sled behind the snow machine, and she saw bullets hit the machine and King. One bullet hit Byram in the upper right arm. King drove the snow machine as fast as he could toward the south, away from Hastings, but one of Hastings' shots had broken King's leg and he soon lost control of the machine. The snow machine crashed and threw King and Byram onto the runway near the path leading to the Heglins' home. Byram tried to load King back onto the sled, but Hastings was quickly approaching. King told Byram he could not move, and he urged her to save herself. After a moment's hesitation, Byram fled toward the Heglins' home, As she ran, she heard two shots and knew King was dead. When she reached the Heglins' house, she saw the front door had been kicked in, so she ran to the greenhouse and hid outside. As she huddled shivering, she heard Hastings approach, calling out, Come on out, he's not dead yet. She held her injured arm and fought to stay quiet, certain she was about to die. She heard Hastings' footsteps on the porch and knew he would soon find her. But then, abruptly, he turned around and sped off on the Nash snow machine. There were only three Alaska state troopers within 100 miles in any direction available to respond to the massacre at McCarthy. The troopers knew the situation was dire, and they didn't have time to wait for backup. They commandeered an oil company helicopter and ordered the pilot to fly to McCarthy. Hastings headed west on the McCarthy Road, where the troopers from Glen Allen easily intercepted him by helicopter. Hastings waved to the helicopter, realizing it was not a trooper helicopter. He saw a chance to get a ride to town and make his escape. When the troopers exited the helicopter, he quickly told them he was Chris Richards and explained that Lewis Hastings had gone berserk and was shooting up McCarthy. The troopers knew Richards was already in Glen Allen, though, and Hastings had identification in his pocket. The troopers arrested Hastings without incident. With Hastings handcuffed and restrained in the helicopter, the troopers continued to McCarthy, where they found the bodies of Tim and Amy Nash and Harley King on the runway. They were all dead from gunshot wounds, with final kill shots to each of their heads. Inside the Heglins' house, the troopers discovered the bodies of Les and Flo Hegland and their neighbor, Maxine Edwards, stacked in the bedroom. A bloody, fur-covered silencer sat on the nightstand beside the bodies. Troopers found the injured Byram outside the greenhouse and helped her to the helicopter. She was forced to share the ride to Glen Allen with the man who had murdered her neighbors and had tried to kill her. Why did Lewis Hastings go on a murderous rampage and kill his neighbors? The reason is nearly as bizarre as the crimes themselves. Hastings was an intelligent computer programmer who had worked at Stanford University in the late 1970s. But like many people who moved to Alaska, he left the overdeveloped area where he lived in California with dreams of starting a new life in the unspoiled wilderness of Alaska. At first, he and his wife settled in Anchorage and he started a computer service business out of his house. But by 1982, his business and his marriage were failing, and he began to spend more and more time at his cabin in Kennecott. 
Alaska's economy was booming in 1983 due to the construction of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, which carries oil from Prudhoe Bay south to the Port of Valdez on Prince William Sound. The state was flush with money and in the midst of a construction boom. Hastings hated the pipeline and the related development it had created, and he felt the state's newfound prosperity would ruin the lifestyle he had dreamed of when he'd moved to Alaska. It became his mission to destroy the pipeline. Hastings finally divulged his convoluted scheme to authorities. He had planned to arrive in McCarthy before the mail plane and kill anyone who showed up to meet the Tuesday plane. Next, he would kill the mail plane pilot and steal the plane. He then planned to fly to a pump station near the pipeline about 80 miles or 128.7 kilometers west of McCarthy. Then he intended to steal a fuel truck and ram the pipeline while shooting at it. This action, he believed, would badly damage the pipeline, but he hoped the oil would congeal in the cold winter temperature and not do too much environmental damage. After rupturing the pipeline, he then believed the fuel truck would burst into flames and char his body beyond recognition. He hoped people would think he had been murdered in McCarthy with the other residents, and his family would never know he was the murderer who had committed suicide in the end. Troopers learned Hastings had never before shot a live animal, so to prepare himself for his rampage, he practiced shooting rabbits. He felt if he could shoot a rabbit, he could shoot a human. The weekend before the massacre, Hastings learned his wife, was, who was living in Anchorage, was having an affair. The upsetting news might have been enough to push an already angry man over the edge. Lewis Hastings brutally massacred six people on March 1, 1983, because he believed murdering his neighbors was a necessary first step in his brilliant plan to preserve the Alaskan wilderness. Less than Flo Hagelin, Maxine Edwards, Tim and Amy Nash, and Harley King died in the McCarthy Massacre, and Chris Richards and Donna Byram were injured. Lewis Hastings was sentenced to 634 years in prison. As a sad footnote to this tragic story, Chris Richards, a man the surviving residents of McCarthy considered a hero because of his swift actions saved more people from being killed during the 1983 massacre, died when his Kennecott cabin burned down one week before Christmas in 2001. After his death, many who knew Richards said Hastings had finally claimed his seventh victim. Richards never recovered physically or mentally from the massacre, and in later years, survivor's guilt, depression, and alcoholism plagued him. According to those who knew him at the time of his death, he was trying to give up alcohol and was suffering from hallucinations. The McCarthy Kennecott area is now a popular tourist destination, but like most remote areas in Alaska, the crowds leave in September and only a few hardy individuals choose to live in such a desolate wilderness in the winter. Most of these people cherish their solitude, but they often must depend on each other to survive the long cold winter. For the folks of the McCarthy area, it was not easy for them to trust their neighbors again after the horrible Tuesday in March 1983. And Mail Day has never been the same since. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review at Apple Podcasts so other listeners can find me. I've written three Alaska wilderness novels, and my fourth novel will be released soon. Check the show notes to learn more about my novels. I also write a newsletter about murder and mystery in Alaska. If you would like to receive my newsletter, check the link in the show notes to sign up for it. I write one newsletter a month, and it will include the links to my podcast for the month. Also, please check the show notes for my social media links, and I invite you to connect with me. Soon I hope to have a Facebook page dedicated to my podcast. Thank you again, and I will see you next time with Murder and Mystery from the Last Frontier.